That's right there. I'm Mark. Uh, it's really awesome to be here at Android TO. I've heard about this event over the years, and it has not disappointed, as you guys just saw that incredible display and all the speakers today. It's been really great. Thanks a lot to Mark and Kaylee, who have just been wonderful putting this whole thing together. So this talk is about a lot of things. It's focused on Google Home, which I couldn't be more excited about. Uh, when they introduced Google Home at I.O. 2016, uh, all I knew was it was a small device, it had some microphones, some speakers, and really just opened up a developer's imagination of what was possible with a voice interactive device. And we're going to talk today about a lot of things related to Google Home, but one of the things I want to emphasize is that Google Home which is built on top of the Google Assistant, which is really what you program as an engineer, uh, is available in a lot of form factors. It's not just the Google Home. So just real quick interactive portion here. How many people have had access to the Google Assistant? All right, that's a trick question. All, unless you don't have a smartphone, you should be raising your hand. Even if you have an iPhone, uh, the Google Assistant is available on the iPhone. So I'll save a little bit more about that until later in the presentation. I do also want to say one of the neat things about this, especially because who I am, I'm an Android engineer from Denver, Colorado, who happens to know a lot of Google employees, but is not a Google employee, and happens to hang out with a lot of Google developer experts, but isn't encumbered by all the agreements that GDEs make with Google. So in the last 24 hours, there have been all kinds of leaks and cool information about new Google Home related stuff, and I can talk about all of them. So that's pretty, that's pretty special and, and great. I'm pretty thrilled about that. All right, so. Uh, 
so there's there's a whole history of studying language and how people, how humans communicate, which can be very complicated in engineers, as we all know, and even more complicated than programs that we write. Okay, so let's talk about when you guys should pay attention. So you either fall into this kind of nerdy engineer, uh, super awesome product designer, or some mixture of the both. And this graph here tells you when you can zone out, when you can go get some more cotton candy, uh, go take a bathroom break, or possibly get on Twitter and, and spread the love about Android TO. So in the first section, we're, uh, we got a mixture of content for both folks, but a little more on the product side. Second section then leans more heavily towards technical individuals. Third section is almost exclusively for technical individuals. And then the last section is a pretty even split. You guys got all that? All right. Okay, now speaking of Twitter, uh, I expect everybody here who is on Twitter to get out and tweet some hot takes like this new uh, leak that came out yesterday. And I've highlighted some of the important hashtags and at mentions uh, in this little note here. I'll give you a second to consume that. And you already remember from the last side when it's okay to look at your phone, and update words with friends, check your email, etc. Okay, great. So here's the first part of the presentation. We're going to talk about the things you can do with Google Home, this gentleman over here, uh, which is a device that's constantly updating uh, all the time. There are new features, and the Google Home app itself, at least on Android, I'm an Android user, is uh, it's, it changes all the time for the better. Uh, sorry, this is the overview. The, the next section is the vocabulary. Uh, we're, that's valuable for pretty much everybody, and it's going to tell you how to talk the talk. We're going to do a high level overview of coding Google Home. And then we're going to talk about product design within voice interactions, which everybody here is familiar with calling up some kind of an IDR system. Maybe it's an airline or a phone company. Uh, maybe the Gen Zers in the room have never called a phone company, but most everybody has called a phone company, <coughs> definitely an airline. And there are these conversational phone trees. Well, phone trees are dead. We're into the ebook version of phone trees at this point. And there are, there are tricks of the trade to making a good, positive experience for a human interfacing with a machine. Okay, so the product. What can you do with a mic and a speaker? Really what I would say is, what can't you do? I, I can't believe the number of experiences that are possible with Google Home and Google Assistant devices. From hands-free help when you're in the kitchen, trying to figure out a simple conversion, maybe I'm reading a Toronto-based cooking book and don't know my uh, milliliters from liters and only know cups and tablespoons, uh, to getting directions, to really all the valuable things that we've come to know and love from our smart devices. Uh, there are new form factors. This is the uh, one of the leaks from yesterday. This is the Google Home Mini. You can see that it, it has a power cord. Now, this is not official information. This is just what came out yesterday. Probably some of you saw this already. They come in three different colors. Uh, it's supposedly going to cost 49 US dollars and it appears to me like it would have a less powerful speaker. It wouldn't sound quite as good, but it would be convenient to have, especially at a lower price point, to be able to ask questions and get information from. And this is not the only new form factor. We'll get to some other form factors in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about some of the cool things you can do with your Google Home. One of my favorites, being a Google Play Music subscriber since Google I.O. Anybody help me? 2013? What was the year that they, they gave discounted Google Play Music subscriptions? Uh, I, I think it wasn't even called Google Play Music back then. I can't remember. But whenever it first came out, I became a subscriber. And one of my favorite things about my Google Home is being able to say, hey, Google, play Arcade Fire. OK, Google, play with Rolling Stones. Maybe I'm cooking and I want to relax a little bit. Hey, Google, play some jazz. And it will just 
pull from my subscription and play music. I can, I can play playlists, etc. Uh, at Google I.O. 2017, which just happened earlier this year, they announced some new features with calling. And those just got opt activated. So now you can actually talk to your Google Home and you can say, hey Google, call dad, or call mom, or call any contact that's in your phone. And something that's especially neat is that now that Google Home is powerful enough to identify who is speaking to it with multi-user, the uh, command call mom will be different for different users. So if I'm hanging out uh, with a friend and they say call mom, it's going to call his or her mom. And if I say call mom myself, it will call mom. Now, there's a downside with calling right now that they're kind of working out, and if you're a Fi subscriber, it, it doesn't really impact you quite as badly, but there's no caller ID when you, when you make calls. Uh, something that I've recently come to love about Google Home, this new feature, is the adding items to a shopping list. So I can say, hey Google, add bananas to my shopping list, and later I can say, hey Google, what's on my shopping list? Or even better, at the grocery store, I can go to shoppinglist.google.com and see my list as long as I'm logged in on my phone and I can figure out what I need to buy. You can also say, hey Google, Bluetooth pairing. Now this is a very uh, divisive feature on, on the Google Home team. Uh, they originally wanted the device to be exclusive to the CAS technology, that, this Google uh, proprietary. They eventually realized that people did want these devices to act as a Bluetooth speaker. So now your Google Home, which always had Bluetooth radios inside of it, but they weren't turned on, can now act as a Bluetooth device. And you initiate that by saying, hey Google, Bluetooth parent. And that's useful if you have apps or content on devices that you want to cast on a nicer speaker that might be on your device, but do not support the cast technology. The Google Home app is where you go to set up multi-user. The app grows all the time. Uh, just yesterday I found a new, a new command you can use, which is uh, Play Pac-Man. And so you might be wondering how you play Pac-Man by voice, and that's, that's a very good question. I was wondering the same thing myself. Uh, when I said it, it prompted me on my phone to enable a permission, which was to allow Google Home to control my phone screen. So you can actually tell your home now to give you experiences that require another device that, that you can play on your screen. Of course, I spent like half an hour trying to uh, dominate at Pac-Man on my phone. Uh, things are at, being added all the time in the Home app, and the Home app is where you go to explore all these new features. So I'm going to tell you a couple more today, but next week there are going to be more, next month even more. And hopefully some of you guys are going to even program experiences that will be discoverable inside the Google Home app. And you'll be able to find those soon. And again, it's not just Google Home. It's any Google Assistant powered device. A bit of foreshadowing. OK. Anybody familiar with the Twitter account, Volume Down Power? OK. Very select few. You guys should check it out if you're into uh, weirdness in the Android land. It's basically a collection of the worst things in Android experiences. Uh, my challenge to this large audience is somebody out there needs to create a Twitter account for bad experiences with Google Home. They have it. Uh, my favorite, which got fixed coincidentally about three days after I tweeted about it last year, I'm pretty sure they're not checking my Twitter account, but somehow somebody figured out that people were asking, hey Google, how many tablespoons are there in one third of a cup? Which was something I needed while I was baking cookies one day. And it responded, and I, I laughed out loud, 5.333333333. And unfortunately, that, that little bug is gone. There's another one that I really enjoy, which, which I haven't tweeted yet, so it should still work when you guys get home. Uh, it, I don't know if it's America-specific, or you know, if it will be different in Canada, or it's related to my Google Play Music account. But people are probably familiar with the movie Stand By Me and the song Stand By Me that's uh, real popular. I wanted to hear it the other day, 
And I, I said, hey, Google, play Stand By Me. And it sounded great. Started playing the, the uh, you know, old kind of classic version of it. And then all of a sudden, a very loud Japanese voice interrupted and started translating all the lyrics in Japanese. <laughs> so you can look on your phone and see what it's playing. It's playing some, some Japanese translation version of Stand By Me by default. So you guys can let me know on Twitter if the same thing happens to you when you just say, hey, Google, play Stand By Me. Quick, quick note about hey, Google versus OK, Google, which I probably shouldn't say. I won't say it again. Let's just say OK Big Search Company. If, if, your, if your phone is turned on, OK Big Search Company will activate the Google Assistant and on your phone and any other device within earshot. So Hey Google is a really good trick to use in the house. It's what I use to talk to my Google Home because the phone will ignore Hey Google. But if I say OK Big Search Company, both the phone and the watch and the Google Home, and the Google Home upstairs, and the, the other phone that I have in my office will all like chime up helpfully, how can I help you? It's kind of annoying, so, so use Hey Google. Another great feature of Google Home, which is going to become even better with the Google Home Mini, now that there are more inexpensive devices available, is synchronized music play across your house, or really across put one in the garage, uh, et cetera. You can set up groups in the Google Home app. So I have a group called Entire House, and I have two Google Homes in my house, plus a Chromecast audio that's connected to a home speaker system, and they're all part of that group. So if I say, hey Google, play Arcade Fire using Entire House, that using keyword tells Google to play that music on all three of those speaker systems, and they play perfectly in synchronization, which is really impressive when you go try and find a competing product, and you'll probably end up at Sonos, which are very, very expensive devices. When you consider a, a Chromecast audio is about 35 US dollars, and Sonos speakers are in the hundreds to multiple hundreds of dollars. It's, it's really amazing. So that, that's a great feature of Google. One of the things that happens once you start developing apps, and even before, I, I did this when I got the 5.33333 bug, is you want to know what Google Home heard. I also could have checked when I said, hey Google, play, stand by me, and some Japanese man was talking out my Google Home. It's interesting to see what Google Home actually heard. And you can see your voice history of your interactions with the assistant and a lot of other history at google.com slash history, which will redirect you to the My Activity website. You check the assistant box, and we have an example of that here. You can see uh, two interactions here. You can see that if you want to, you can actually play the recording back. So instead of play rain sounds, it said play cane pounds. You might wonder why did home do a bad job translating that voice to text and you could actually play it back and maybe there was some loud music in the background that the person had a heavy accent or something to that effect. Uh, play rain sounds is another power feature that I like about Google Home that I've recently discovered. If you like white noise when you sleep or when you're studying or reading, say hey Google play rain sounds is a great way to get some nice white noise. And then you can see an example here of adding bananas to my shopping list as well. So pretty much we're getting towards the end of, of the first section of this talk. Uh, but let's dive into the new form factors first. You can now make your own Google Home, and I've done this at home. This is a, a kit that comes from AIY, Artificial Intelligence Yourself, which is something that Google uh, promoted. It costs about $35. US dollars, very inexpensive, and they sound like crap. Uh, <laughs> and they also, when you play back the audio, they, it sounds terrible. They, when you buy cheap microphones and cheap speakers, they, they don't sound great, but they do work, which is pretty amazing. And they have the power of the Google Cloud behind them. 
but they, they, they really make you appreciate the directional microphones and the speaker quality in the actual retail Google Home. In the middle here, we have a set of Bose QuietComfort 35-2 headphones. These are not for sale yet, but they showed up on Best Buy's website yesterday, which piqued my interest. Uh, these are Google Assistant-powered headphones, which do not exist yet. Google can't talk about them. You can't buy them, but they are coming very soon. And the way they work is you have your headphones on, and you're studying or on a trapeze, and uh, they will chime, and you can press a button on the headphone, and it will read a notification to you. So maybe it's a text message from your mom, and you want to respond to your mom. And so then there's a different button that you can hold down to respond. So you can just say, uh, yeah, I'll be there at 6.30, and it will dash off that message back to your mom, which is pretty cool. It's, it's a new kind of form factor for the Google Assistant in Google Home. And then on the far right, we have a Sony product. It's the LFS50G. Uh, costs 250 US dollars. It's a beefier speaker. It's got a different kind of display on it. It does have uh, lights on the top to indicate volume, kind of like a traditional Google Home. Uh, Google has allowed other manufacturers, much like Android phones, to make their own versions of Google Home. Google Assistant powered smart speakers. And so you're going to see speakers come from all kinds of companies soon. There's going to be a lot of competition and different shapes and sizes and prices on these devices. So this is exciting as developers. We always want this. Uh, we want you know, large market penetration and mass adoption. And these new form factors are going to help that in the Google Assistant space. All right, so that wraps up Google Home product. Now it's time to move on to vocabulary. So let's start with surface. Surface is a word with many connotations. In this context, the Google Assistant can be interacted with on many surfaces. It could be your watch, it could be a large automobile, it could be a phone, it could be a tablet, it could be a speaker, and as we just saw, could be headphones. Traditionally, we know Google Home as a speaker, but all these services are touch points for the Google Assistant. An invocation trigger is just a really fancy way of saying, of, of communicating, what does the software need to respond with? When dealing with Google Home and programming on Google Home, there are a lot of new terms you have to learn. The Google Assistant, we've talked about a lot. When you write software for the Google Assistant, you're actually programming actions on Google. You're going to have your users use invocation triggers. And then some back-end service, probably up in the Google Cloud, some kind of web book, is going to fulfill user requests. Now, I'm going to make a point with a joke I once heard. And so you guys can all read that. And then there's the punchline. And it, it's funny because, one, I'm from Colorado in America. And I'm contractually obligated, even not as a user of marijuana, to speak about marijuana because it pays my roads and pays for my schools, etc. We should all visit Colorado. Uh, but this is funny, I love my antique dealer. He sells the best weed because there's ambiguity in the language. What does antique mean in that first sentence? Is it an antique dealer, like somebody who sells big clocks? That's what you initially think, oh, an antique dealer. Uh, but antique is actually an adjective describing the dealer, not what the dealer is selling in this example joke. And this gets to the heart of what makes programming voice interactions difficult. They're not mathematically uh, simple equations. They're humans converse in very confusing ways. We use a lot of shortcuts. Uh, this is what makes it difficult for somebody to jump into a conversation halfway through it. And it makes context especially important. So maybe this wouldn't be as funny if, if we were having a conversation 
about marijuana <coughs> for drug dealers. Uh, but because there isn't any context here, it can be confusing to know what to do. And we're we're going to get to Bryce, who's the gentleman who's in the Stanford philosophy paper later. We're going to talk about Bryce's maxims and how they impact human conversations. There are a lot of acronyms in Google Home development and usage. It's like anything. Uh, I'll give you guys a second to look at those and see how many you know. One of my favorite things in being in the audience is am I smarter than a speaker? I know everything a speaker knows. Give me a second. Uh, so we have natural language processing, machine learning, which is enormously important for the leap from kind of old school phone trees to today's kind of just generally pleasant human voice interactions. We have the knowledge graph, which is Google's kind of, you can ask it anything, how do I get from point A to point B by a hot air balloon, and somehow magically a big search company uh, can figure that out through their amazing knowledge graph. Uh, text to speech, which is an important part of when you humanize your interactions, you want a lot of different variations. You might have a lot of different text strings, and there are different voices that can read that back. And then there's voice user interface, or VUIs, which for you product people out there, you can throw that around now and do an acronym for you. The kind of core concepts in Google Home programming boil down to intent, context, and entity. And intent in English parlance is what what do I mean when I say something? So if you if you have kids or you talk to kids, really if you talk to adults, if you talk to engineers, a lot of things get misunderstood. Really all humans are at play with misunderstanding the English language. And intent can get confused. So it's important when you design these systems to understand the intent of the speaker. Intents are triggered by certain phrases that allow the software to know uh, how to respond with an action. Entities are nouns, essentially, for lack of, for just to simplify it. Uh, if I tell a Google Assistant powered device, I want to get to the stadium to watch the Blue Jays play by bus, then important nouns in that statement are bus is a critical one because I don't want walking directions or driving, direct, or, you know, driving myself directions. Uh, and context is also important uh, to allow the system to know what uh, domain we are working with. So, a couple important concepts from API.ai, a little bit of foreshadowing of what we're heading towards. Uh, intent matching allows you to match and categorize user utterances to an intent. And entity extraction is the action of identifying keywords and phrases spoken by the user. And so, that's Pretty much what we talked about, we talked about surfaces, when we talked about vocabulary, we talked about acronyms, and we started the foreshadow API.ai, which we will get to thus far. So now we're into Google Home programming. You have a Google Home device. We now know that we all have in our pocket, or unless we're tweeting right now, in our hands, a uh, Google Assistant powered device. We pro probably a lot of you just realized you have six different devices between your tablets and multiple phones and whatnot. And as most engineers desire, we want to tinker with these devices. So how do we do that? One of the best introductions that I've found to programming for the Google Assistant is the trivia meet. You can go to triviatemplate.com you can see in the background here a GitHub repo. This is an API.ai agent that you can import into your own account, and it handles a trivia game's natural language understanding. understanding. The fulfillment logic for the gameplay is implemented as a cloud function for Firebase. 
And it's, it's a very sophisticated game. It has three different personas and 750 different prompts that were designed by a VUI team, VUI team. And you now all know what a VUI team is. You can create your own persona, so you can add an additional persona. And you can even add more prompts. There are 44 prompts already in this system. And there are audio tracks for each different persona, including music, correct sounds, incorrect sounds, ding sounds, calculated sounds, end of round sounds. So if you're thinking that programming for the Google Home is, is very basic, uh, it really isn't. You have to become kind of a sound engineer, uh, maybe have a sense of humor. You really have to do all the things that a human is used to having when they have a fulfilling conversation with another human. Okay. So API.ai is a company, they're an artificial intelligence company. They use machine learning to make effective conversations possible. They were purchased by Google in September of 2016 to solve the problem we're talking about now. The best thing about API.ai is that it handles the conversation for you. When a user is talking to the assistant app, they can start with something called the user says phrase. So, find me a recipe for homemade cannoli, for example. That's a user says phrase. Then the Google Assistant and API.ai will process this and find the appropriate intent to handle this phrase. The phrase is processed to extract entities we learned in the last section are important pieces of information you were looking for, the kind of important nouns, if you will. Intents and entities. An intent is triggered by a user says phrase, something like, I'm hungry and want a recipe, or the same thing said a different way, give me a recipe for something. Every intent can be triggered by multiple phrases. And you need to trigger, you need to specify enough sentences to train API.ai's machine learning algorithm. So one of the neat things about API.ai is, let's say you give it five versions of that user says phrase, it's suddenly smart enough to recognize hundreds of versions of that. So if I only trained it with, give me a recipe for something, and I'm hungry and want a recipe. If I then fire at it, I'm starving and need a recipe, API.ai is going to score that with its machine learning algorithms and figure out which intent to use. You can also go into API.ai when, let's say, you do have a widely distributed Google Voice app. You can go in and see what users have done and you can actually tell API.ai how they're doing in different phrases. So if they're new phrases and it's scored as like 75% match to do a certain action, you can modify that. Uh, you know, you can say, well, that was the wrong thing to do. Um, if somebody used slang or confuse it. Okay. It is possible to make an intent require a certain context before it's available for use. Maybe there's information that you have to have before you can continue down a happy path. Welcome intents help guide users to provide the correct information. Enabling a context can enable multiple different intents and allows you to implement flow control. Entities are values that we're trying to capture from the user. It's kind of like filling out a form way back in the day, like a web form. We're requesting details from the user. If we need three entities to proceed down the happy path, and they've only given two, we need to go back and prompt them for that third item. API.ai will help with that extraction. If you've only given, if the user only gives a portion or a subset of the required entities, API.ai will prompt the user automatically for the next entity. This is a, an example of some JSON that you can get when you're uh, 
interfacing with the system. It's kind of like a nerdier version of what we saw earlier where we looked at the account activity. And you can see exactly how API.ai is scoring certain items. And I want to talk a little bit about what kind of experiences you could program. So really thinking outside the box and knowing that there's a cardboard version of Google Home, you can build your own assistant device. So let's, this is an example of a bus uh, interaction, trying to figure out when the next bus from point A to point B is. You could actually have a bus, like a little uh, Hot Wheels bus that you touched, and when you touch it, it would just read out to you when the next bus is. If you had a very large house let's say, and you have friends that visit all the time, and you don't want to constantly be answering questions they might have, like, where is the laundry room? You could set up your own system to answer questions from your guests. And it would look something like, let's say your app was called Butler. You would say, hey Google, talk to Butler. And you'd be switched over into the context of the Butler. And then the guest would say, and the butler would greet the guest, say, hey, what can I do for you? And the guest might say, where is the laundry room? Because in this fictional story, I have an enormous house. It's so good, you can't, you can't find the laundry room. So it's, it's uh, and the butler responds, well, it's, it's downstairs in the basement uh, in the west wing, uh, and you can take the house subway to get there. <laughs> and then you might ask the butler when you get there on a different Google Home. Uh, how do I start the laundry machine? Something like that. Uh, you could also, and this is actually something I'm working on back in Denver, uh, is you can explore different IoT. The previous uh, presentation, you can imagine things with whimsy. Uh, I'm working with a friend on a drink maker that you can talk to. So you can order specific drinks, and this contraption that we're building will actually mix and prepare the drink for you. So, uh, there are a lot of, lot of things you can do. Uh, when you do go into programming for your Google Home, there's uh, this screen, which is a little confusing, and I just wanted to highlight it. Uh, you, when you're testing your app, you see the test button on the lower right. When you push it to your Google Home, it, you have to invoke the uh, your program in a very specific way. It's just talk to my test app. So you say, hey Google, talk to my test app. And it, I had a hard time finding that documentation anywhere, so it's good to know that. All right, so we talked about intents, we talked about context, we talked about entities. Uh, let's move on past Google Home programming into the home stretch and the Google Home product design. Talk about fluency of conversational interactions. So conversational UI, it's important that you have natural interactions with your users. And luckily, there have been hundreds of years of study of human conversation. There's, like I said before, human conversation can be very confusing. We have inefficient language usage, we use shortcuts, and there are all kinds of tricks you can use to make the home seem like a human. One of the best ones is acknowledgers. So acknowledgers, <coughs> the next slide. Yeah, the next slide talks about this. So promoting user confidence can be done with acknowledgers. Things like, okay, sure, thanks, got it. And randomizing those can make the conversation seem more fluent. Now, this gentleman, Bryce, uh, studied something called implicature, and he found that there were several essential elements to a human conversation, a cooperative conversation. And those are to be truthful, to be informative, to be relevant, and to be clear. So if you're a product designer, perhaps a, an aspiring visual user interface designer, keep Grice's lessons in mind. And I have a link later 
Uh, we won't go over all of these, but here are a whole bunch, I'll also share these slides later, uh, of buoy do's and don'ts. So here's that link that I promised. So when you design your conversational interface, remember the three C's. Be conversational, be cooperative with the user, and instill confidence in the user. Now that's the end of the product design. And for those of you guys who paid attention in the beginning, you know there were going to be four sections. And that's the end of the four sections. That means we're kind of drawing to a close. So let's summarize what we learned today. We talked about programming the Google Home and really expanded beyond that to all the surfaces that are powered by the Google Assistant. So your watches, your cars, your tablets, your speakers, soon your headphones. We saw some leaks that came from Google. Keep an eye out on October 4th for maybe the headphone announcement that might come separately, but definitely the Google Home Mini. Uh, we talked about four different things. We talked about how to use your Google Home as a power user. You're soon going to be able to get this, this uh, interface very cheaply with the Mini. And then we talked about vocabulary that was important for Google Home programming. We talked about how to get started with coding with API.ai, the Google Assistant, and to write your own actions. And we closed out with some product design tips, some BUI tips, or voice user interface tips. And that's how to program that fancy Google Home that you've got. And I'm Mark from Colorado, and thank you everybody for coming out.